We are really uh, suffering under an embarrassment of riches with the keynote speakers here, to say the least. The uh, yesterday with uh, Dr. Limka and Professor Agamben, and tomorrow with Oren Katz and Ian in it sure and uh, Carol O'Reilly uh, and uh, tonight no less Professor Rosie Bridotti. As you probably know she's a, a scholar who won't require much of an introduction but I'll give her one nonetheless. She was born in Italy and raised in Australia. <laughs> Graduated from the Sorbonne in Paris and became a founding professor of women's studies in Utrecht. She is Distinguished prof- University Professor in the Humanities in a Globalized World at Utrecht University and Founding Director of its Center for the Humanities. She's been, written a lot of books, as you know, and many of them have been translated into over 20 languages. She has held v- various visiting professorships, including those in London, Melbourne, Frankfurt, Buenos Aires, and the European University Institute in Florence in addition to a fellowship at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. In 2007, she received an honorary doctorate in philosophy at the University of Helsinki. In 1989, Bradati established a network of interdisciplinary women's studies in Europe at part, as part of the Erasmus program, and in 1997, she set up the European network Athena, which won the Erasmus Prize of the Lifelong Learning Program of the European Commission in 2010. She was responsible for starting gender studies at Utrecht, as I mentioned, became the first director of the Netherlands Research School of Women's Studies in 95. She is a leading feminist, post-structuralist, and interdisciplinary thinker, and her work examines everything from new materialisms, including cybernetics, info technologies, ecology, nomadic thought, subjectivity, aesthetics, and ethics. Her publications include... And I, we're only going to be reading the highlights here. The publications include Patterns of Dissonance in 1991, Nomadic Subjects, Embodiment and Difference in Contemporary Feminist Theory, 1994 and a second edition in 2011, Metamorphoses Towards a Materialist Theory of Becoming in 2002, Transpositions on Nomadic Ethics, 2006, and Nomadic Theory, the portable Rosie Bradotti, which came out in 2011, and there is a, uh, a brochure a handout that's floating around, the uh, portable Rosie Bridati, which must be good to be portable the, uh, on that. And uh, what seems to be a new work, which I hope we might hear a little bit about tonight, the posthuman. Uh, scheduled for publication in 2013. So it is a great pleasure and an honor to welcome Professor Bridati. Thank you, dear Matthew, for the generous introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here, this amazing conference, and thank you, Stephen, for inviting me to at least a chunk of it. I wish, of course, like all overworked academics, that I could have been present all along. Amazing in this day and age with the economic crisis to put together such a marathon. Well done, Dublin. Good for you. Indeed, um, I'm going to try to keep you awake with some thoughts emerging from this last book, which I swear is my last one ever. Uh, on the posthuman. And uh, considering the, the theme, the topic, and what I imagine to be the mood of the conference, to share with you my thoughts about the exhaustion that one feels at the unthinkability of the category of the human today. And maybe this should be a full stop and we should open the discussion just on that. The exhaustion, of course, a good ter- term that I uh, interpret with my teacher Gilles Deleuze in his work on the theater of Beckett, when it says the exhaustion is an intransitive state. You're not exhausted of something, you're tired of something, but you're just exhausted, full stop. <laughs> this, it's an ontological condition that doesn't require any immediate transition to a concrete object. The exhaustion one feels about the unthinkability of the human is something that I think is a generational trait. And I would situate this sort of exhaustion at the core of the contemporary humanities. Uh, I was just talking to Ronita about this. Isn't it strange that the radical generation that I am very proud of belonging to, the generation that entered the university 
in order to transform it, to change the curriculum, the long march through the institutions, the generation trained, my um, great teachers, um, Foucault and, um, and, and Herde Deleuze, Herde Rigere, but the Foucault of the death of men. We started off really attacking, at least I did, uh, a certain notion of the humanist subject, and that we'll speak very briefly about this because I assume that all of you know all of this if you are at this conference. But the same generation that begins, uh, attacking a certain idea of the human, intrinsic in the humanities, ends up in the middle of the neoliberal takeover of the university, having to defend them. How the mighty have fallen. And, and if half of me is cheering happily, thinking, yes, the end of the humanities, that man that Foucault said was dead in 1966, it's like all dying stars, they continue to reflect shine of a reflected life forever and ever. Well, that man is finally hitting, biting the dust. And yet, what a catastrophe that the institutional translation of this should be the situation that we find ourselves in, at least in continental Europe, fighting for the survival of the old faculties that used to be called letters or arts and now are lumped together in a new administrative category called the humanities, which is about to merge with another um, administrative category called social science and humanities, SSH, which God only knows what will mean for the employment possibilities and the mental health of the generations to come. So in a sense, the exhaustion that one feels about the unthinkability of the category of the human translates into an institutional crisis that occupies us, the teachers, and preoccupies the students, quite rightly. I'm at the point now where I tell the young ones to get out as fast as possible and, and get jobs elsewhere, because the, the, the future looks exhausting, exhausted, <laughs> get out of here. Um, so this, I'm a very cheerful person, but the paper is probably unusually pessimistic and in its tone. So let me tell you a little bit how I've organized the thinking, and it's a bit the structure of the book to come. I will go very quickly on the posthuman as posthumanism, because I assume that we all share that. It's, of course, a big assumption. And some of you may want to come out as crypto-humanist or neo-humanist or residual human. That's fine. We can still go for a drink afterwards. Nonetheless, I have become aware in my middle age that the anti-humanism that I learned from my teachers is so much part of everything that I think and I breathe and I believe in that I somehow take it for granted. And that is a major mistake in the world of today. Then man, the measure of all things, if you know the Vitruvian model of Leonardo da Vinci, that white male heterosexual able-bodied drop that gorgeous, probably heterosexual, though knowing Leonardo you never know, uh, owner of men and chill of women and children and the wealth of the earth, that man is something that I have spent most of my, my professional life attacking, critiquing, <laughs> deconstructing uh, with my feminism, with the relationship to our anti-racist and post-colonial studies, to all the areas of the humanities which are infradisciplinaries. And it isn't it interesting that so many of us and performance studies would be an example are part of the studies part of the humanities. There are disciplines, and then there are studies. And if you know James Chandler's work on critical disciplinarity, he says, well, there's history, and there's uh, literature, there's philosophy, and then there's media studies, women's studies, post-colonial studies, performance studies. I've, in the book, I made a list of all the studies that I could come up with, and you look at the proliferation of studies. The more men white, male, heterosexual, able body disintegrates, the more the studies areas come up, animal studies, disability studies. Um, the Cold War comes and we get de 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 peace studies and, and conflict studies. And, and of course we're all exhausted, so now I have my favorite University of Bath, death studies. Um, <laughs> yes. So this model, um, this model of the humanist man of reason that my teacher Jenny Lloyd already in 84 in the famous feminist book, a foundational text, The Man of Reason, she already cuts him to sizes. This man that is not only a normative model for the individuals and for different social categories, but is also a civilizational model. He carries a certain idea of Europe 
and already Edmund Husserl in the 1930s, in the crisis of European sciences, already social sciences, he already upholds this ideal as a civilizational ideal. He's the man of reason. Europe announces itself as the site of origin, of self-reflexivity, and he is the Vitruvian man beautiful, able-bodied, all the stuff that we know, representing an ability, a capacity, a propensity for self-reflection, which is supposed to be unique to Europe, unique to the West. And this, this arrogance, this epistemic arrogance of believing that this, this is the culture that has actually made reason, its distinctive feature and self-reflexivity, its own inner characteristic. This is everything that I have spent my life uselessly, as it turns out, attacking and critiquing. How one assesses the anti-humanism of the generation of the entire post-war period, from after Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir. Remember Sartre writing, writing, existentialism is a humanism. And Simone de Beauvoir embracing pretty much uncritically humanist ideals of inter universal feminist solidarity. If this, if, 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 if man is the measure of all things for classical humanism, for Simone de Beauvoir, woman is the measure of all things female. So to study the situation, the condition of women, I have to look at myself because I represent part of a universal category called women. Then that absolutely activist, Marxist humanism is everything that my generation took on and rejected. We were raised by Foucault and Irigaré saying, what do you mean universal? What, what do you mean by women? What could that possibly be? And so you get the, the fracture of the anti-humanist generation as opposed to the Marxist humanism of the post-war generation. If you are a post-89 a person, um, bless your soul, the idea that Marxism may be a humanism may even be shocking. You may even say, what is she talking about? Marxism is a criminal ideology that leads to the killing fields. And so we need to look again at how Marxist humanism and lays the grounds for this anti-humanism of the generation of the post-structuralists, which in fact are post-Marxists, and they, they, they react uh, against a certain dialectical universalism, woman the measure of all things, universal solidarity, workers of all lands unite. If something can happen to one of us women, it can happen to all of us. Let's join forces and defeat the enemy. Beautiful. Um, the anti-humanist generation took that on and, and pulled it down to sizes, questioning very much the categories that are at stake, the category men, the category woman, the category workers, and, and developing studies areas that would allow us to go in the interstices between the disciplines in order to zoom in what exactly is the human that we are talking about and what exactly is this man, the agent of history, and, uh, that is supposing to be the motor of some sort of teleological unfolding of a destiny that we are all supposed to share. Uh, here, race and postcolonial theories did amazing foundational work. And again, studies areas, not discipline. And Sojourner Truth saying, am I a woman too? Do I belong to that category? Or am I infrahuman, and subhuman? And, uh, are blacks of the human kind? And is there a black in the union? Jack, um, Are Women Human is the title of Catherine McKinnon's um, uh, book, uh, traditions in which a sort of a double take um, about the human is at work. On the one hand, a recognition um, of a common sort of mode of belonging. On the other hand, a tremendous sense of estrangement from that category. And what has the human ever done for me is very much the question that Mary Wollstonecraft asks of Rousseau, but it's the question that Fanon asks of phenomenology in the post-war years. And you may remember that in the preface to The Wretched of the Earth, Jean-Paul Sartre says, 
about Fanon's work, if humanism is to survive, it will survive with the forces of people outside of Europe. It will survive with the input of African humanism, of creolized humanism. It cannot be the enlightenment of, of uh, humanism or the Europeans that carries the future because those ideals have been brutally b betrayed time and time again in colonialism, but certainly massively in fascism. And so for the, the, the generation of pre-89, the question of fascism, the question of the Second World War, cast a very long shadow on this human, on this man, and on his, and it is a he, incredible um, pretensions at representing the totality of our species, the totalities of all human culture. What's that human ever done for me? So we have here a paradoxical, complex, contested alliance between the anti-humanism that develops within critical theory in what we could call, for lack of a better term, the West, um, a, 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 an internal critique of the ideals of humanism and of, of a certain estrangement from the idea of the human within fortress Europe and on the other hand more multifaceted and in some ways more generous takes on the human coming in from outside the West, coming in from post-colonial theory, coming in today from people like Vandana Shiva who says, well, you've really screwed that one up. Let us now look at this with the eyes of Asia, with the eyes of uh, Indian uh, modes of co connection, Ubuntu work coming from Africa. Let's do this with other cultural traditions, shall we? So there is a neo-humanism not rooted in the West that is incredibly robust and incredibly alive, and I always feel feel enormous admiration and um, a sort of profound um, uh, ambivalence towards that type of neo-humanism. I who belong to the exhausted category or the anti-humanist who are thinking about the center from the center, not because we are arrogant and blind, but on the contrary, because we are located, situated, we practice the politics of location, and we make ourselves accountable for the specific slice of territory that we happen to inhabit here and now. If the, if the, imminent, the politics of imminence means anything, if, if, if the idea of the biopolitical is grounded anywhere, for me it has to do with the feminist politics of location. Speak from where you are, ground your statement somewhere specific and make yourself accountable for it. So no, I will not be a neo-humanist, I'd rather be exhausted and strike an alliance with the many forces outside the West that are reinventing humanism, hoping that that human will not be the one that I've had to carry like a dead sack of potatoes on my back for most of my thinking life. So this is the neo-humanism part, humanism, anti-humanism. So the posthuman as posthumanist. Are we all in agreement with this? I suspect not. I hope not. Look forward to your questions and to your statements of new kind of internet back and ecologically driven planetary neo-humanism. I shall applaud and remain profoundly exhausted and nonetheless. <laughs> As if this were not enough, in comes the posthuman as post anthropocentrism. And that poor man who had already been called to task for representing every single axis of oppression that the cosmos had ever thought of, on top of everything else, has to account for the fact that he represents a dominant, belligerent, arrogant species, Anthropos. Now, I would like you to do a test for yourself. Take a good glass of Guinness and, and run this by yourself. Don't do it in public because you will lie. No matter how vehemently anti-humanist one may be, and I'm certainly one, when it comes to taking distance from our own species and run with the doggies and the uh, companion species of Donna Haraway or of the, the, the companion uh, pigs um, of our leading wonderful artists that I have enormous admiration for, there is always an element of oops, not really. And so are we all really crypto anthropocentric thinkers, no matter how anti-humanist we may be. When it comes to anthropos, male or female, the idea of exceptionalness, exceptionalism, as it is called in a more derogatory manner, really raises its ugly head. It is very difficult to even think 
the decentering of anthropocentrism, to think in geocentric ways, or to think the way I try to do with the Deleuzean materialist um, Neo Spinoza's philosophy, thinking from Zoe as non human, animal, um, vegetative, planetary life, but not bios not the famous bios of the biopolitical, and little by little I will be mounting my case against biopolitical as a term, and uh, it doesn't really help us enormously in these post-anthropocentric times, is the, the, the sort of crack of my, um, uh, of my argument. We are living in zoomorphic, zoocentric, geocentric time, so uh, what can we do with categories such as bios, the speculative, specifically human, as in anthropos, strokes, man kind of um, life, what can we do with that category? Not much um, is my uh, uh, answer to cut a long story short Foucault so the light and he saw, he had a profoundly correct intuition about the fact that life was becoming the material that capitalism would move into, but he practically shut the same door that he opened by not completing the work. It's a, it's a problem when people don't finish their books. It's a big problem. And, and uh, Michel did not. It just my good teacher did not finish the books. And so everything is speculative. Everything rests on one three-page text on and the rise of the biopolitical, and everything is, is in the hands of um, fragments and speculation. The guy who does the work, the guys who do the work, who write the books, who think seriously about the displacement of anthropocentrism are of course Deleuze and Guattari and on top of everything else they write a magnificent book called Foucault which is the best introduction to the virtue of Foucault and, and consequently to Deleuze and Guattari that you could possibly get. And there's something here that needs to be looked at much more carefully about the perversity and the profound love of this palimpsestic sort of exercise of writing on the body of the other, the virtual book that the other should have written and never did because he was too busy playing and being famous. And in, and in the lack of those books, of course, we are left with endless speculations as to what the biopolitical may have been in an era which is by now proudly zoopolitical, so who cares? Anyway, I don't think that we can do a whole lot with this category, but again, it is for discussion. Why are we in post-anthropocentric time? Because biogenetic capitalism is a perverse and opportunistic system that has devoured the human. Full stop, we can all go to the pub. Advanced capitalism has generated its own commodification of all that lives. I mean, this conference is all about this. I don't have to say anything more. Um, the commodification of all that lives creates a very perverse, in the sense of it's sexy and it's opportunistic, in that sense of perverse, parallelism among all species and categories. We're all the same because we can all be traded. Cells, seeds, organs, bits and pieces, body particles. It is all part of a great, enormous trade in all that lives. Our universities profit from this. Trinity College, big player on the biogenetic market, and in nanotechnologies, in stem cell research. And we don't have to worry anymore about the consumption of nature. We are constructing the very materials that we are consuming. University of Delft has just pioneered the first prototypes of artificial meat. Goodbye, animal rights. Take a long walk. Capitalism is going to take care of that one. Of course, the politics of life itself. And, and this creates a parallelism among all species which decenters the exceptionalness of anthropos, of that human. So isn't it funny that the capitalism itself is doing that because it is so interested in farming out the informational power of living matter, the codes, no matter where they come from and to, to what type of organism they happen to be attached. That's the capital that we are looking at. If you know and you do Melinda Cooper's work on life as surplus, that's the added value. That's what we are farming. And, and, and it doesn't matter where that particular informational data is contained, in which corporeal, bodily, organic, physiological envelope it, it happens to be 
uh, available, we're going to farm it out anyway. Our robotics industry is mixing the uh, new neural capacities and capital of the human with the senses and the perceptions of far more elaborate and more sophisticated species, of course pigs, but also um, insects, dolphins, dogs for their scent. We are replicating the sensorial apparatus of species that are far superior to the good old bodies of these anthropos that is actually being surpassed in neural, in perceptual, in perceptual and um, uh, physiological capacity by many other species. How the mighty have fallen. If you want a good sense of sort of a good lesson in humility, talking to people in robotics and, and neurosciences cuts you down to sizes, thinking, oh my God, on top of everything else, we belong to an obsolete species, as if we didn't have enough problem and, as it is. Um, if you look at this in the negative sense, we get into this doom discourse. I prefer to look at the displacement of anthropocentrism by advanced capitalism with Deleuze and Guattari. Deleuze and Guattari are the A Thousand Plateau is the manual, <clears throat> the book that does the political anatomy of advanced capitalism. They help us understand this schizoid circulation of living matter and what mode of resistance and what mode of interaction are possible with this. I prefer to look at this indeed in terms of an affective term in terms of the cognitive capitalism, if you want to go with um, uh, moulier Boutin, in terms of new politics of biomediated bodies, but these bodies are transversal entities that cut across species. You cannot talk about bodies now or as, as the prerogative of one dominant species. In the period of, in the historical era of biogenetic mediation, you have to assume at least a parallelism of multiple species, and this positions all the debates on um, evolutionary theories and, and uh, the specificity of the human in a far more interesting and much more contested life. If you've been following the debates, chimpanzee versus bonobos, and Franz Deval versus cognitive psychology, you will know that we're really here debating um, uh, nitty-gritty issues as to whether the model of evolution is the aggressive chimpanzee-driven um, uh, sort of masculine survival of the fittest, or whether it is a much more diffused, eroticized, female-driven, to a very large degree, system of the bonobos, which is a way of creating social cohesion through sexuality, affectivity and care. It seems like, uh, you know, good versus evil, but this is the, the level of the debates, and I think evolutionary theory is one of the missing elements, I would argue, in critical theory in general, and in feminist theory in particular. It's as if Darwin had been put to the side, and of course it's changing now with Liz Gross and a few recent examples, but of the four horsemen of the apocalypse of modernity, Freud, <coughs> Marx, Darwin, and Nietzsche, Darwin is the missing one. And I think that the left, with our social constructivist tendencies, has simply neglected the naturalized other, has neglected the animal others. It's part of our legacy. It's one of the missing links that the younger generations are going to have to um, uh, look into and repair. So the genetic figure of the human is in trouble from within, X-Men, says Brian um, Masumi, um, and Donna Haraway it puts the uh, nail in the coffin. Our authenticity is warranted by a database for the human genome. This is man, the taxonomic type, become man, the brand. And I think that the branding of the human with the human genome is an internal takeover. It's an internal displacement of species superiority by advanced capitalism itself through our science and our technology. And I repeat, the universities are at the heart of this. And yet when it comes to thinking about this, even in STS, in science and technology studies, and certainly in a lot of bioethics and biogenetic discourses, what I notice is a tendency to retreat into humanistic values and premises. And so we, we are sitting in the middle of a post-anthropocentric exhaustion of the category, but when it comes to thinking it, packaging it to the university, to the government, God knows, to the, to the larger public, in walks again 
and a sort of crypto residual humanism. You see this in Franz De Waal. On the one hand, he shows that there is practically no difference in the organization of society between upper primates and our own. Uh, world. On the other hand, it emphasizes as the distinctive category for the organization of, so of society, care, empathy, compassion, all the good things, and um, all the stuff that the chimps don't do. Um, uh, a lot of science and technology, and Peter Paul Fabek in Holland would be an example, bring in heavy doses of Martha Nussbaum on the importance of the inherent, the inherent so the nature of moral goodness, um, as if this was supposed to palliate some or the disastrous awareness that we are a species among others and, and really up for grab and we have exhausted our, our specificity or our exceptionalness. So a lot of residual humanism being carried in by the universities on the, maybe to mask the catastrophe that is the perverse opportunistic post-anthropocentrism introduced by advanced capitalism in its biogenetic format. Methodological implications of this contradictory take are catastrophic for the humanities because we don't know where to turn. It's damned if you do and damned if you don't. How can we think such a category as the extinction of the human? This is the question that Deepesh Chakrabarti asks in his foundational text on history um, and the, the role of the, 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 the impact of the climate change question on the practice of history. If we have to think climate change seriously, argues um, um, Chakrabarti, then we have to think extinction. But extinction is unthinkable. Extinction assumes that we can think a time beyond the existence of our species, which is a contradiction in terms. So how can we do this? History cannot do it, because history assumes finite periods. It's a discipline, it's not a studies. A finite periods that we can zoom in on. So history either embraces <clears throat> geology and becomes natural history again, or it dies. Chakrabarti is now launching this program, by the way, <clears throat> at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, a program on the Anthropocene humanities, the humanities in the era of Anthropocene, which is the era of the exhaustion of the, sp of the uniqueness of the category of the human. And if, trust me, if Princeton launches this, it's here to stay. It's a way of canonizing the question of the unthinkability of the category of the human at the point of its exhaustion. But what are the implications for the disciplines? Can the humanities survive this? How can we cope with this um, um, complete challenge to the centrality of a certain category, the human, to our own practice? Seems to me, I will not probably get to the conclusion, seems to me that the inspirational sources to get out of the doom will come from those studies areas. Um, it is the studies areas that have developed the tools to move beyond the decline of the classical man of humanism. I think we really have to start again from post-colonial studies, from gender studies, from feminist studies, from media studies, from performance, and from those studies areas to get the tools and the methods to move beyond this catastrophic decline of the meta-narrative, the master narrative, the grand narratives of human exceptionalism. And if you look at the success of animal studies, and other studies today, uh, enormous success, uh, the is an academic academic hit machine, anything with animals today, it's huge, and uh, it's a really good example of what exactly is the subject of animal studies. And animals, are, yeah, I don't think so. Um, it's far more complex than that. It's the exhaustion of a certain specificity of a uniqueness of the category of the human. I told you about that study, so, so you can look at that and, and have a good um, giggle. Okay, so the, can we think um, the uh, humanities beyond this anthropocentric uh, field is the uh, question. I want to draw a quick parenthesis, um, it's not in this version of the paper, but I want to work a quick, a quick parenthesis, if I may, on a related issue here. The same system, uh, advanced capitalism, that profits from all that lives, has put in place one of the most effective necropolitical technological machines that we have ever seen. The extent to which the death machines of contemporary military warfare and their all 
the complex social and economic apparatus that counts as the war machine today, the, the importance, the extent to which this particular instance is integral to the financial and economic punch of advanced capitalism really needs to be um, stressed and emphasized. And again, the universities are major players in the recomposition of what used to be called war in the good old days and when we still believed in peace. And, but after the success of the biopolitical needs to be reframed today as the necropolitical governmentality of advanced biogenetic capitalism. The extent to which our technologies are married to a military enterprise that is ruthless in its effectiveness. And here, and you may have heard me say this before, my, the example that I always give is the death of Gaddafi, or Colonel Gaddafi, that you've all watched on endless television screens and computer screens and on internet, you've all seen how that bloody tyrant, and he was a tyrant, the question of that, how he ended up with a bullet in the head, <coughs> shot by one of those young thugs, those barbarians <coughs> who have no sense of human rights. God knows what the human of human rights is, but never mind. We all seen what they did, how he was ended up. What an indignity. And then they filmed him and they put him on YouTube. What's wrong with them? Okay, well, what, what did really happen to Gaddafi? How did Colonel Gaddafi get to be in that sewerage at, at the outskirts of Sirte, which then allowed him to be caught by the young rebel and being shot in the head? He was hit by our air force, of course. There was an air raid. An air raid that hit his convoy, dispersed him, wounded him, and then he scuttled away like a rat to meet his undignified uh, final end. But how, what exactly did hit him was a couple of French mirages, and then the jewel. The jewel in our weaponry, a drone. The drone had s taken off from the American bases in Sicily, had hit the convoy, and that drone was operated by a bunch of brilliant young computer engineers in a, an American airbase just outside Las Vegas, thousands and thousands of kilometers away. President Obama, soon to be re-elected, we hope, has um, uh, promised, has committed 50 billion American dollars to the next generation of drones unmanned flying vehicles of a level of sophistication and effectiveness that we can only dream of. The universities are at the forefront of drone technology research, MIT, big time, but the University of Delft in the Netherlands as well. And, and the smallest drones are as small as a little ring and they fly around and they're just flying cameras. And the biggest one are, of course, the killing machines that we all know. Drones, the most effective necropolitical device um, that we've been able to invent. They are sh completely changing the shape of what we call war. They're changing the shape of biopolitical governance by making um, the question of who survives and the question of who dies, Foucault's rendition of um, the question of the biopolitical, making it almost a uh, redundant question. And who has the means of flying these monstrously effective jewels? They are gorgeous things to look at, terrifying things to look at. And again, cognitive capitalism cannot be disengaged from the necropolitical technological apparatus that we are developing, and the universities are right in there. So I wanted to add this to the biogenetic nature because it's, otherwise it, we get euphoric about Anthropos and our genetic database and we forget the extent to which this has generated a mutation in our capacity to kill. And, and the reason why the West is still the best is, of course, this type of military superiority. A military superiority that we deploy because we are the perverse uh, culture of um, uh, humanism, we deploy in something that we call humanitarian wars, and the humanitarian wars are what Chomsky calls military humanism, with of course a very opportunistic and terribly ironical twist 
think again what is the human of humanitarian wars um, and what is the technology in, involved in this. So what can we as people of critical theorists in the humanities do? And that will be my conclusion and it will not be negative and pessimistic. I've depressed you long enough. Um, although I hope that with the stuff of the drone you will be Googling them and going into it um, immediately. Um, I think the humanities have the means to uh, produce a robust alternative to all of this if we have the courage to mutate, if we have the courage to change. And of course, this is like saying to my colleagues in the history department and in the Dutch literature department, you know, do read some of the studies areas. Take, take one of the post-colonial texts. Have a look at what new media is doing, which for a great deal of humanist scholars is simply not an option. And so we come back to our critical theorist's complex relationship to the disciplines. But supposing that the disciplines of the humanities were willing to undergo a mutation towards the posthuman, what enormous resources we would discover at our fingertips. What incredible alternative archives we have through the history of cultural studies, Stuart Hall and beyond, to the extent to which uh, cultural studies went into the, the study of science as early in my political culture as 1983 with Gillian Beer's study of Darwin and literature, early 80s. And, and then, of course, comes Fox Keller and then comes Stephen Jane Gould. There's a whole world of things who have thought beyond the categories. Somehow, they didn't really make it into university curriculums big time and they never got any of the big awards, but the stuff is there. If we could become um, Foucaultia in the sense of the first generation of Foucault, the first phase of Foucault's work, looking at the constitution of domains of, of knowledge and look at the construction of radical epistemologies as genealogical sources to rethink the humanities today. Think of the work with them on visualization and science. Again, from Stephen Jay Gould, but Carrie Jones, Peter Gallison, uh, Jordan Nova, and Celia Lurie. It's, it's, the list is enormous. To look at science as a visualization exercise, which means interpretation, identification, which means cultural coding, and not neutral, not at all distance, loaded with um, assumptions, with interpretations of the world. How about the anthropological turn? If there is a winner in the humanities today is anthropology. Everybody's doing ethno something, and even of internet, and uh, at the extent to which anthropologists like Paul Rabino have shaped the discussion on the biopolitical for better or for worse. And, and how does anthropology, on the one hand, uphold a certain type of anthropocentrism and then flippantly just throws it out and, and goes with wind and pa plants and strange objects? And media studies, where do we, believe, do, where do we start? And embarrassment of riches in terms of alternative discourses available to renew a field that insists on staying married to a certain restrictive category of the human. That man, that man of humanism that continues to claim the centrality of its role. This man that continues to say the proper study of humanity is man. What if the proper study of the humanities was the posthuman. What if we needed to look at transversal assemblages that are nature, culture together, we do come after Donna Haraway, connected to social mechanism structures and devices, connected to gigantic technological network that amplify our capacities, our abilities to the end power. What if the proper object of humanity today and of the humanities as a university category were these posthuman transversal assemblages. What if we had to think beyond ourselves, stretching the limit of thinkability? What if science fiction were absolutely something that is obsolete today because reality has taken it over? And I will give you quick, three quick examples of the extent to which reality has killed science fiction and how the humanities can renew themselves by embracing a posthuman future that would have to rest, in my terms, on a genuine post-anthropocentrism, not the opportunistic brand invented by advanced capitalism, and on a productive form of anti-humanism. I just wanted to remind you that both Habermas and his good friend Cardinal Ratzinger have been really talking about 
the necessity of humanism over and over again. <laughs> and that after, before he became Pope Benedict XVI, Cardinal Ratzinger issued several strong indictment of any posthuman leanings. And Habermas has written a book about you know, the, the fear about our posthuman futures. And there's a kind of moral panic at the thought that maybe we have a posthuman temptation here. And the Pope has said time and time again that Christianity is the only religion that ensures an intrinsic connection to reason. So if we want to be serious about thinking the human, we have to embrace Christianity because it's the only religion that has an intrinsic connection to reason, which means all other religions do not. So you can work out the consequence of this statement. So in this particular context, with figureheads like this, bringing us back to the foundational value of certain humanism, I would say, no, let's take the other route. Let's go with the posthuman as a transversal, as an assemblage. Let's ride the posthuman, the post-anthropocentric tendency of advanced capitalism with Deleuze and Guattari to record it as we go. But that's the road to go. And I will give you some quick examples. The first one is, um, again, coming from environmental history, Chakrabarti, saying we must forget social history, cultural history. We have to go with geological history. We have to think the long time planetary history, thinking the life of the planet, unthinkable. We have to use the tools of geology and natural sciences, geosciences to do that. Another example comes from my university, the One Health Movement. Utrecht University has just created the first chair that combines medicine with veterinary science, anthropos with other animals, because we suffer from the same diseases. Even Dolly the sheep died of arthritis, really. And she wasn't even an animal, really, if you really want the real definition of the terms. And one health movement, looking at epidemics, looking at what we share. It's all in place, and my friends in the medical faculty have no difficulty thinking beyond anthropos. They think it's silly to remain so anthropocentric. But they go a step further. They say it's the tragedy of the humanities that we are so anthropocentric. No problem for the medical faculty to create a new chair that combines veterinary, veterinary science and classical medicine. La, 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 la. Can you imagine that in a philosophy department? Digital humanities, whether you do it with a long room hub, whether you do it with Catherine Hales, and the idea of network societies. I mean, the literature is so enormous, the field is so well constituted that it, defeats, it defies any quick synthesis. That is not an area that assumes the centrality of the human, and not in any way. Bruno Latour laid the foundation, and the situation grew completely out of hands. And then my favorite, of course, nomadic subjectivity with a new Spinozist, Deleuze and Guattari, transverse assemblages, a, 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 an idea of the subject that is not the same as the man of humanism, is not the same as the speciesism of anthropos. <clears throat> it is a compound, it is a hybrid, it's a work in progress based on an ontological vision of relationality. We are relational machines. We connect. And I don't want to sound like those hippies, remember? Connect to the cosmos and I don't wear shoes so I can connect to the earth, please. Um, although the hippie stuff is there, it's not the way I want to go to this. I want to go with complexity um, at the level of our relational capacity. And I would like the humanities in the 21st century to be the, the kind of cultural branch of complexity theory, that we actually deal with this complexity, saying we have the resources to come to terms with all of this. And the proper object of study is not man, is not anthropos, is our infinite capacity to renew, to reconnect, to reinvent yourself. So I started off being exhausted, but I'm such a pathological optimist that at the end I say to all of us in critical theory, let's not despair. We, we did try to sort of um, march through the institution to change them. They're collapsing under our very noses. But we are the custodian of an incredible capital of critical theory, of a com complex intellectual inheritance. And as Stefan Collini says, if you are the guardian of such a complex intellectual inheritance which you did not create, then it is not yours to destroy. So fight on, my friend.
gentlemen, in case you need any convincing, that was a tour de force. <laughs> Smoke is coming out of the ears. Absolutely brilliant. Inspiring, and uh, I think it's what we all sort of have come into academics, academics for. It's really brilliant. So look, let's open the floor. There's a million thoughts there. Know how you might want to uh, join into the conversation, please, sir. Well, the microphone should be working here, Dan. You see? Yeah, just on you. Just hit the mic button on the top. So, were there? You're, what, the case I sit here. Do you see me, or do you want me to stand up? I don't mind. Maybe I should. Well, I'll, I'll stand up. Go. Okay. All right, shoot. <laughs> Thank you for the exciting talk. Could you say something about the concept of nature? Um, is it as, um, uh, has it disappeared uh, in, in the same way as the concept of man? I'm thinking of Kate Sofer's book, What is Nature? And the argument that um, we have to assume a um, reality of something outside of uh, constructed um, stuff, if, if we are going to be committed to, to protecting and saving nature, there has to be something outside of our constructions. Um, so do you have any thoughts? Yes. Great question. I, I answer as we go. Uh, and Kate Soper is a great person and her work on anti-humanism is extremely clever because she also argues, and I didn't do that in the paper, how difficult it is to be a proper anti-humanist. And even the, 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 the conclusion of my paper saying let's fight on and it's the, the legacy of the humanity is not we didn't create it, so it's not ours to destroy. That's a perfectly humanist statement. Um, so it's the impossibility of being an anti-human is what Kate Soper did already in the 80s. But now to, to your question. The problem is the limitation of the method of social constructivism. And it's a really big problem. And the idea that uh, whatever nature may be, what matters is the social coding, the social constructs, um, uh, is so central to critical theory. Um, in my political culture, it is summed up marvelously by Simone de Beauvoir when she says quite simply, one is not born, one becomes a woman. That statement today is scientifically disputable, if not false. Uh, in a number of ways, if you look at it endocrinologically, hormonally, evolutionary, the extent to which, and this is the work of Elizabeth Gross, sexual difference, for instance, is written in our genes. <laughs> so, so what is, of course, the next part of the question, but to stay with the location of nature, um, I think that the social constructivism is not the methodology that we need to make sense of what's happening to us. My teachers, the French philosophers in the 60s and 70s, spotted this immediately because they were already critiquing the foundations of Marxism, which meant critiquing the foundations of Hegelianism. And if you look at the circle of students around young Althusser, um, uh, Macheret, uh, Balibar, Deleuze himself, although he was in Lyon, he wasn't in Paris, he was doing his own thing, they switched to Spinoza to answer your question. This was in the early 60s. Macheret writes his famous book, Hegel or Spinoza, in 79. That book was translated last year into English. Hegel or Spinoza. So it's the base switching from a dialectics of nature, culture, and a social constructivist methodology with all the Hegelian philosophy of history and the stuff that we know to a Spinoza monistic ontology that assumes a continuum nature, culture, with variations, um, uh, multiple variations. That was the switch. Um, and it's a switch that somewhat got lost in translation as the post-structuralist thing becomes deconstruction picked up by the big American universities, chasing, throwing out all the interesting political stuff, becoming this thing that we had to deal with throughout the 80s. Sorry for all deconstructionists in the room. Uh, but the, the, the political punch was taken out of this philosophy in translation, and I think it's coming back now through this unstoppable, wonderful, unexpected thing, which is this wave of interest in Deleuze, which is way out of control and, uh, and completely uh, sort of harping on 
this Spinoza's uh, ontology, which then reconstructs completely um, the nature of the problems. If you read somebody like Jenny Lloyd's Part of Nature, which is her commentary on Spinoza. For Spinoza, of course, we're part of nature. What else would we be part of? Planet Mars? Uh, we're part of this planet, of this territory, of this ecology. And we are within that, with our own configuration, what a body can do, and bodies can do very different things. Um, I finished my book with two bodies, Usain Bolt and uh, Oscar Pistorius, the two bodies of the Olympic Games, and two very, very different bodies, what bodies can do. Um, so today, the idea of the extension, the enhancements of what bodies can do is a banality, but it's very difficult to think um, within the parameters of social constructivism. Assume a monistic ontology of bodies that are part of natures, brains that are embodied, and bodies that are embrained, and then you have a very different set of premises. I think where Deleuze is going very strongly today is in the discussions about neurosciences and, and the new kind of neuro recompositions of the human. So nature has mutated, and we are part of nature. Essences, remember those of you who were alive, vaccinated, and functional, those endless discussion on essentialism in the 80s, we wasted years of our life um, uh, debating essentialism. I at least took a side with, with, with Spiva, said, I'm, I'm a strategic essentialist, it's fine by me, and I believe in differences, bye. But that cost me tremendously. People thought, oh my God, biologism, uh, reductionism. Essences are a big thing at the moment, and an essence is not a negative thing. We have come out of our Marxist nightmare that nature is the enemy that we have to conquer. And I think we are looking at the ecosophical continuum with very different lenses. So I think that this would be how I would um, begin to answer your question. Uh, Neo-Spinozist, um, and there are complications with this and there, there are criticisms of it, but it's at least the beginning of an answer. I know that if Donna Haraway were here, she would give a different answer, um, but it would, I, I still argue that it comes very close to the same. A nature culture continues and then the specificity of the human in terms of, of what bodies can do, bodies being embrained organism and not Cartesian, dead, inert matter. For the humanities, this would be a conceptual revolution to try to think from these premises. And the only area that does it really well is environmental studies and that's frowned upon as being soft and not rigorous and not serious. So it's a huge question. I hope I've kind of done justice to it. There was a question right up front, yes. Um, yeah, Hi. Oh, me. Yes, please. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Good thank to see you. you. Really, um, again, for sort of putting a, a wonderful perspective on the kind of work that we do, it uh, makes me feel less lonely. Um, I want to go back to something that you said about halfway through, about needing to include Darwin, or needing to go back to Darwin, which is something that I agree with, but I'm not... I, I really need to, to, to think it through more. Um, for several reasons. One of the, one of the reasons is because um, because of evolutionary psychology, to be honest, mm -hmm. that worries me, um, and that kind of seems to want to take over what we do. Like, you know, we don't need critical theorists anymore. We don't need, you know, it's another way of saying we don't need the humanities because right. evolutionary psychology can explain everything. And, and you know, the Victorian novel was all about, yeah. you know, <laughs> a display of, of, of what is kind of part of our, you know, absolutely. Um, so that's one thing that worries me. The other thing is this, this the persistence of, the, of the, the, the two cultures, which is bizarre in this post anthropocentric world. Yeah. Why? Yeah. My question. Uh, I think we need, it's fantastic, we need a, a six-month uh, seminar to do this. <laughs> yeah. um, I'll tell you, I think we'll all sign up. <laughs> it is like now, the, um, the point about, about Darwin, I guess it comes from my uh, Foucaultian methodology, that if we had a constituted archive of history of discussions about evolutionary theory, we would probably be in a better position now. And if you look at some of the work that the feminist culture has produced, Liz Gross would be my example here, there is the enthusiasm of the neophytes that are plunging into evolutionary theory, putting sexual difference in, hooray, hooray, I hope we can find the gay gene and then we're so settled, we have it all part of nature, so we, we are safe. And, um, so there is a bit of a, I think we are lacking robust density of our 
archival evidence to reconstruct our conversations. And I think we do come from social constructivism, from Mary Wollstonecraft to really just before Donna Haraway. That's our political culture. And that's the political culture of the left. And, and I repeat, nature did not score very well in that. It was this object out there that we were very, very happy to leave to the, those nerds in the science faculties as we went on theorizing the multiple revolutions, which we all lost one after the other. We didn't win a single one of those. Um, so that's, that's the only thing I, I can say. I think, of course, we have pioneers. I think Hilary Rose did amazing work on this, as this Gillian Bear. We, but, but it's not part of the way that we think. And part of the difficulties with the reception of the work of Donna Haraway, um, if you know the the figure of the, the illustration of the doggy, the dog is the measure of all things, which is, of course, a caricature of the human exceptionalism. The, the difficulty of the reception of the work is, is, is due to this absence of this particular archive. So I think we need, and I have great difficulties with evolutionary psychology, of course, but that is one of the fields in which the, the, the biopolitical you know, confrontations are today. Um, and, and when I mentioned the bonobos versus the chimps, which is an enormous discussion, but the bonobos are now Hollywood stars. There are movies about the bonobos as the new figures, the new factors of evolution. Um, uh, they are heavily gendered, the heavily racialized discussions. Um, uh, and it seems to me that my political culture of feminism is not very present in these discussions. I'm afraid that we're going to kind of go down with the decline of social constructivism, that we cannot disengage ourselves from crypto-anthropocentrism. We are attached to the species after all. And, uh, and I think that the, the, there are, of course, signs that the new generations will, will do better. Luciana Parisi, with her work on bacteria, is a source of great hope. And, People go berserk if I say that our political future is determined by social theory based on the behavior of bacteria. They think that we are sort of gone nuts, um, uh, let alone what philosophy departments would do with such a statement. And so there are indications of what, but I think, I think there's a long way to go, and I wonder whether we will have the time to make that leap. Now, the persistence of two cultures, absolutely spot on. Um, I think we need to look uh, at... Uh, here that we need a discussion with the STS people, with the science and technology people, seriously. And, uh, and a huge corporation, and then again, in the terms of studies, science and technology studies are obviously the great um, arena of today. Where cultural studies was in the 80s, science and technology studies are today. That's the arena. That's where the discussions are. Now, if you look at the digital, <coughs> if you look at the um, biogenetics, Questions of interpretation and representations are central. So it seems to me that this, this, the, as far as they are concerned, there are no two cultures, that they have absorbed an enormous amount of information. It, the language of cyberspace comes from literature, of Gibson. Um, so the, they would say, oh, no, no, it's a new alliance. The problem is how we perceive it from where we are standing. Um, the problem is whether post-colonial theory, feminist theories, but also histories of literature, histories of nation states, which is what history are in Europe, whether they can survive the challenge of the demise of anthropos. If, if we start from a geomorphic per, uh, perspective, what kind of history do we write? And the history of the mountains and the valleys of Ireland, and, and the, the history of human intervention upon rivers and forests, what would that give? Um, can, would that still be the culture of the humanities? Uh, I call it post-human humanities um, in the book, post-humanities, if you wish. And the question then would be, what kind of university structure could frame this new this interdisciplinary ex or transdisciplinary exercise. It would it still be a university? So there's a whole discussion here about what is the format of a university and that we would need. And people like Stephen Collini have written wonderful stuff on this. And I would go very much with the idea of the multiversity, not the university, the multiversity, which was launched by the rector of the University of California system in the 70s, saying we need a multiversity, multivocal and multidirectional, and not just the two cultures, but multiple relations of the multiple cultures. But what would that do to staff meetings? What would that do to our staffing policies? And I repeat, do we have the time to conduct this mutation in the present socio-political context, or are we simply going to go down SSH 
and then merged and with the people who can't think of anything else so they just go from merger to merger and at one particular point it will be merged as a subsection of, of, of sort of biogenetic and something. Um, mind you, it's again a science fiction scenario. So uh, yes for the discussion of the two cultures but then multi-directional uh, but I do think the question is there uh, and this is the age of the, tri we're living through an incredible scientific revolution and it's not ours and it's it's uh, it's, it's it's happening elsewhere so we we may need to be humble and eat humble pie for this more seminars on this six, six more months but thank you for a great question yeah. are there other questions i'm sorry oh, yes sir i would like to come back to your like um biogenetic capitalism um, as eradicating the frontier between human and humanity and all the other species by making everything saleable, tradable. And I think maybe you're trying to catch up with the scientific revolution that is not that far as it's supposed to be after what you're saying. Because I'm, I'm completely with you as far as the genetics part is concerned. Everything is interchangeable and, in a sense, tradable. But since there's capitalism in the image as well, I'm not sure whether we will be trading everything or whether there maybe will emerge a new kind of human that is that one which uses all the other species, including other humans or former humans, for their purposes, which are capitalist purposes. So maybe because capitalism is not this flat strata that genetics made of all living beings by a very hierarchical system, I'm not sure whether the combination of capitalism and genetics will lead to this completely flattening out of everything living, in making everything credible, or whether there will be emerging a kind of humanity that can take all, all the rest of nature for their purposes. Well, <clears throat> I would have to ask you then, where would you stand to make that statement, um, uh, that there, there is no flat parallelism, as I called it, mm, of all tradable uh, uh, and sellable um, commodities. If you look at simple statistics on trafficking, trafficking of animals is, um, if I remember correctly, second to traffic in women, ahead of traffic of weapons. Um, uh, traffic in cells and seeds and industrial secrets linked to stem cell research is uh, at the heart um, of, of, of what we do through our complex legal system, to, through copyrights and intellectual property laws and all the question of patenting and who owns the genetic code of what, which is what Vandana Shiva calls biopiracy. So it seems to me that the evidence w where I am standing from, from the type of cartography that I do, of, of, of the biopolitical, i.e. necropolitical punch of advanced capitalism, the evidence is overwhelming that we are trading on everything um, that, that can generate any short profit. What I also notice in your question is that you have a vision of capitalism as hierarchical. Reminds me a bit of Adolf Huxley, Brave New World. I do capitalism with Deleuze and Guattari as a flat ontology. Um, as a system that spins differences for the sake of commodification and does not need hierarchical structure. What it needs to do is arrest the flow, i.e. a re-territorialize entity long enough to recode that specific territorial discourse and then resell it. And I think our financial crisis is the example of this. We are trading on debts and making them. It's, if you've, it's just complete, it's complete insanity. I mean, the idea that capitalism has a plan or a teleology is really a 20th century idea. It has none. Um, it, it goes, it spins, it proliferates, deterritorializes, create fake um, post anthropocentrism makes money on it, sells it, blocks it, resells it. It's an axiomatic system that changes the rules under your nose constantly. And the A Thousand Plateaus is taught in management schools. It is used by special forces. We know it is used by the Israeli special forces because it gets the reading of capitalism right. And, and it, it breaks my heart to think the critical theory is put to that use, but at the same time it tells you how totally effective that reading of capitalism is. So no hierarchy, but controls of speeds, velocities, re-territorialization, de-territorialization, axiomatic mutation under our very 
noses and it's a very difficult machine to beat because it makes no sense at all. Um, who said this way before anything else and anybody else? It's one of my favorite um, leftist thinkers and that's Rosa Luxemburg. Um, Rosa Luxemburg wrote her dissertation uh, on the un, uh, unstoppable nature of capitalism. She argued on the grounds of, of actually her own environmental awareness and environmental sensibility. She argued the system will stop at nothing until it has used up every single available resource, until it has eaten up the earth. And to think that we can stop this system is simply delusional. She was at the time studying at the Polytechnic of Zurich together with a guy called Lenin. And Lenin said, Rosa, that's far too intelligent. Nobody will get it. We're going to have a simpler theory, the dictatorship of the proletariat, so that we can run a revolution. <laughs> the intelligence of an eagle, he said. Then the fascists, of course, got Rosa Luxemburg and her husband killed them, um, and that's the end of that. But if you reread Rosa Luxemburg, you can see this other, because I'm very big on genealogical sources, that if we have the archives, we can go back to the future and start again. And she said it will stop at nothing until it has devoured the sources of everything. And she would have taken in nature. She had already taken in the planet, but not, of course, uh, for a manipulative um, warlord such as our Lenin. The Rosa Luxemburg faced, as they call it, in Germany is the single biggest left-wing rally outside of the love parade. And it draws millions of people every year. So we may want to start again uh, from a Marxian rather than a Marxist, um, such as Luxembourg, and see if we can think um, this pernicious... Um, the pernicious senselessness of advanced capitalism, which makes it so difficult to resist. And, and if you look at the drones as an example, it's very difficult not to be seduced by the technology of the drones, an incredible technology. Then you lo look at them in action, you think, good Lord. And Paul Gilroy is tracking drones. His new work will be on killing machines. And he just did a conference at Imperial College or something on... Um, sort of post-colonial wars and bombings and how we went from the first Italian planes over Libya to the drones over Afghanistan and, and the racialization and the denaturalization involved in this. So watch Gilroy on the drones and test your own complex reaction. Oh my God, what a machine. And oops, what a necro-technological, necro necro-tele-technological nightmare. Um, and I think that the face of contemporary capitalism is this, and this is why it's so difficult to defeat. But it's not hierarchical, it's flat, and it's so close to us. It's almost too close for comfort, particularly for us in the university. And so we have to start really looking at how we're using research budgets, if you really want to start defeating this. Um, and I can just see the rector of Trinity College going, what do you mean? <laughs> you can just, I, just, I can just design that conversation for you uh, if you want it. Is there another question? Yes. Yeah, please, in the back. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, I think there's like these two things going on, and I'm curious how they relate to one another. These two things I'm seeing playing out in your talk, but also in general, kind of right now. On the one hand, you're saying, okay, I'm going to be optimistic. Let's break down the nature of culture divide. Let's think Spinoza. Let's think Deleuze. You know, and, and this is what everybody's saying right now. You know, the, the new materials and whatever you want to call it. SDS. I'm a geographer. Everybody's saying it. Mm -hmm. um, break that down. Okay. As this sort of like positive future uh, directed sort of project. On the other hand, you're saying that's already been broken down. That divide has already been broken down, and it's been broken down by biogenetic capitalism. And I would add to that, you know, cybernetics. You can think like Catherine Hills and John Pierre. All that the human's been broken down, the subject's been broken down in reality for several decades now through the introduction of new techniques of governance. Also, in, in the <coughs> you know, if the subject was a constructive governance, it's now yep. being deconstructed as a new kind of governance. So, how do these two things relate? You know, on the one hand, you're saying like, here's this you know positive emancipatory project, think beyond the nature culture, human uh, nature divide. On the other hand, you're saying it's already been. Um, broken down. So. It's a great one. Um, I think to do the, in, in the book I do a little bit, but not enough, uh, to, to argue the thesis uh, convincingly, you need to split the timelines. You need multiple temporalities. Um, and you need multiple temporalities to make sense of a Spinoza subject that would have, for instance, and we all do, in our system, um, the accumulated 
wisdom and experience of our species and through our genetic code, which we deploy and which we are unfolded by and to a very large extent. Yes, you will grow old. Yes, you will look like, like your mother. And yes, you will die, no matter how much Botox and other things you do. So the, the unfolding of a genetic destiny, which is the accumulated wisdom of the species. And, and that temporality is, you know, is, is completely transgenerational. <clears throat> and transcultural, um, but we, we in the humanities and we in critical theories find that very difficult to think um, because what, what tools do we have at our disposal to think um, the connection across species, yeah, evolutionary theory, which we didn't do enough um, of, as I said before. Um, we have fantasies of, of, of um, I don't know, t tolerance, har harmonious cohabitation um, uh, with, with the other species. We have aggression and violence as uh, means of thinking about this, but we, we, the, the conceptual poverty of the, of the instrumentarium that we have at our disposal, of the, of the analytical tools that we have at our disposal, is really one of the worrying features um, of today. And, and I think Deleuze was completely right when he said we need more conceptual creativity. We need to dare to create new categories. So there would be one temporal line and very difficult to think the connection between us and all that our species had to go through to produce us the anthropoi uh, of today and um, how do we think that then there are multiple temporalities or again um, are we going to take Freud series again forget Lacan the linguistic stuff is gone but the unconscious structures as intergenerational connection memories of things that didn't happen to us we're critical theory people. We remember all the time things that didn't happen to us. I wasn't alive during fascism. I can't forget for a minute. You know, okay, I'm Italian, we're all traumatized, and we did have Berlusconi, admittedly. But, I mean, it's there. It's the prot I mean, fascism is a virus, as a lot of European cultures have, and it comes up again no matter, at, at any provocation. Um, so can you do feminism, race, work, with a, a little voice at the back of your head that says, remember? But what do you remember? Things that didn't happen to you. So is that memory, is that temporality to be taken seriously? Then we have to accept unconscious timelines. If by unconscious we mean things that we've inherited without actually having experienced them. And I think it's a pity that a lot of people do Deleuze today and consequently dump psychoanalysis. Think, oh, Deleuze didn't like it. But Deleuze didn't like it, but he grew up reading it. So please read it first and then dump it. And don't dump it immediately because we do need concepts of unconscious transfer of information. We need notions like identifications and we sure need an understanding of fantasy because advanced capitalism is on a rampage about fantasy. So we really need to get on to it. Another temporality. And then there would be you know, the simple lifespan of your personal singular memory with the vicissitudes of things that happen and do not happen and the singularity of your own memory is a major factor in creating the cohesion that we call a self. So thinking the multiple temporalities, and it's very crucial to nomadic subjects, and it's even one of the most fundamental axes. I say a location is not just spatial. A location is a memory. You remember multiple things, internally contradictory things. As a woman, I cannot forget that a woman is being raped in the world every three minutes. As a white woman, I cannot forget the extent to which white feminism has been enlisted as one of the justification for the neo-imperial project of the American and British army to conquer the globe. So I'm saying two completely contradictory things in the same sentence because I do not wish to simplify that which history has made complex. And I'm quoting Simon Rushdie on this. And that is one of the great difficulties for the humanities, the non-linearity of the nature of advanced capitalism, which we need to render in the linearity of the language that we've learned from critical theory, can't be done. Deleuze was completely right. We need to invent new categories. We need to really uh, think differently. Can the faculties accept it? Can the university take it? Or are they going to do to us what they did to Deleuze, throw him out as a weirdo? Um, can it be done, and do we have enough time to do it? Non-linearity, the coincidence of internally contradictory time zone, we live that way, why can't we think it?
that's that's really um, the question. And the we there is the we of critical theory, is the we of the humanities, the we that is utterly exhausted by the unthinkability of its own categories, as I said at the start. Probably different for social geography. Um, if you're starting from geocentered perspective, it depends. It, it, um, and certainly you would be close to the necropolitical, the extent to which the control over the territory, surveillance, borders, are so much part of the necropolitical governmentality of advanced capitalism. So you're sitting in a good place in terms of... Uh, and it's almost a discipline. It's not a studies. <laughs> Ronit, did you address? Yeah, I, I want to thank you. I found it fascinating, a real challenge, and I, something to think about for a long time. I want to bring you back to the necropolitical governmentality of armies. Clearly, this governmentality has erased the human because what they kill is not individual human beings. They, they, they don't they dehumanize the, 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 what they kill. What, it's not who they kill, it's what they kill. So you're asking us to actually, as critical theorists, to give up the human in order to critique this necropolitical governmentality and I'm kind of I find it slightly, slightly yes. problem, yeah. not problematic. I don't understand it fully because I don't, I don't, I haven't read all the things you Again, a great, great question. First of all, I didn't say, but it's obvious and it's clear in the book. And the necropolitical was coined by Achille Membe in his wonderful work on post-colony. And, the, and again, the, the use of uh, psychoanalytic tools in Membe's work is um, extraordinarily important. So please do, don't throw out psychoanalysis with the people. Uh, where do we stand? Um, does the new, do the new armies, do the drones erase the human? That is alone a big question. Um, Part of the problem in approaching that question is getting access to the information. And it will come as no surprise to anybody that the war machine, that the army, is a private business. Mm -hmm. Consequently, accessing the information is really difficult. The economies ran a special issue recently on morality and robots. It was just a few months back. And fascinating. Um, and they report about, of course, drones, and the question is, who trains those operators? Are the operators of drones soldiers? Well, obviously not. Are they warriors? Somehow. Are they computer engineers, or are they kids playing video games? Which categories are we looking at here? And if you look at the way they're being trained, and the American army is turning all of their bases from whatever bases they had before to new training grounds, they're all interdisciplinary teams that include psychologists, computer specialists, science fiction writers, ethicists, etc. Et et and uh, The Guardian, following the, the economy special issue, ran a number of interviews with these pilots. And they were all totally euphoric. The kids just out of, of school, they're digital natives. They grew up attached to the screen. They can interact with the technology at zero points in time. They know that they are killing, but they think, I am saving my car. No different from send me than the ethos of the Marines. Uh, they clock in and clock out at the end of the day, and they just do a decent day's work. I have friends working in trauma research saying it's not at all true. These people are complete wrecks and they suffer from all sorts of moral um, uh, you know, uh, uh, dilemmas and they burn out uh, easily. And uh, so, so I don't know which tale to, um, to believe. Um, uh, but the difficulty of getting access to the information is crucial. And here is a category that will not require a university degree to do what they do. And they join a category that contains people like Bill Gates, Steve Jones, and Mark Zuckerberg, all of whom changed the shape of the world without completing a university education. So where does this leave us teachers? Um, uh, if it, and this is, this is the source of my pessimism. Like, like we're looking here at a private enterprise and training as opposed to educating with bioethicists, and the bioethicists are there, but uh, that's another chapter. I prefer to sort of put it aside. Um, and the university is utterly irrelevant to the entire discussion. Um, so whatever critical theory we want to do about this, either we gain serious access to data and I enter in those bases talking to those people, or we would be left speculating. And I know that Delft in the, in the Netherlands is very active, but they do drones also for civilian purposes. 
and um, Greenpeace uses drones for uh, surveillance of uh, marine species and other endangered animals. Uh, so there's a lot of civilian use of drones as well. Um, drones and satellites have a civilian as well as a military use. So maybe we should try to get our own drones and our own satellites and, and, and go out there as critical theorists and saying, hey, just a moment here, there is another point of view, but I wonder. Um, what our chances of doing that. So that's part of the complication of where do we stand. And, and for them, they're not erasing the human, they're killing an enemy, and it is a safe technology because it does not kill our own people. So it's intensely racialized and, and intensely polarized. And, uh, is it different to shoot somebody on the screen or to be the pilot of Enola Gay that dropped the bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki? They didn't know what they were dropping. They, they, they genuinely did not know. Is there a difference? Is this a moral argument? Is it an epistemic one? Is it a political one? I think these are real crucial in discussion. I would call this post-human humanities at their best. Um, but getting access to the data may be the problem here. We don't control it. Well, I think we have pr time for one last question. We're almost at the end of our time. Yes, in the back, please. I just had a comment. Um, I just spent the last half an hour locked outside of this building. <laughs> Surveillance. I, I was helping a friend on the telephone, and uh, I couldn't get into the building. But I could tell by the last three minutes that I'm here that you gave an incredible talk. <laughs> Thank, so you. Thank you. Oh, oh well, that's, uh, that's very kind of you. <laughs> you are correct, sir. Uh, I'm not sure, I, I, I hate to end this, but we're at the time. I don't know what to say other than a deep thank you. It was incredibly inspiring and uh, has really made the conference for me. You've made a fan, I think, of a lot of people. Very so, good of you. Thank you. Thank please, you. welcome.